So moving on, uh, we do still have plenty of time for people's questions, uh, and we're going to give you the chance to connect with Lee and discuss some of the points that he's made so far. So all I ask is that you keep, please keep your questions brief and succinct. Just raise your virtual hand using Zoom features in your menu, and I'll then call on you to come off mute and then speak to our guest. So we're gonna take questions in groups of about three to start with. So if you have a question, you just raise your hand and then we can take it from there. So does anyone, because there was a lot going on in the chat earlier, does anyone have a question for me? And then I can ask you to come off mute. Nobody at the moment. Can I can I ask Andy's question? And then and then my own question. Mm -hmm. um, so Andy's question is Malcolm X's version of Pan-Africanism was radical and revolutionary. Uh, to what extent was he influenced by Marcus Garvey? Um, so the line of Malcolm X from Marcus Garvey, uh, is it right that we can see that as a continuum of Garveyism and Marcus Garvey's politics, I would say. Um, and I'm really fascinated by this question of, I think you called it the uh, Black American patriotism. Um, and it's something that we come up against when we're speaking to our US brothers and sisters today. And it's not something that I really understand. I mean, I understand the seduction of nationalism but I don't understand how it's become so deeply entrenched in the black American psyche, uh, more so than I see in other parts of the diaspora. Uh, so perhaps you could speak to how these myths have taken hold and gripped African brothers and sisters in the States so strongly. Yes, thank you. Uh, that was a two very interesting questions. Uh, the Garvey connection, uh, not only through Malcolm's own family, of course, his father and mother were committed Garveyites, um, but the Garvey movement itself was the continuation of uh, the debate among African Americans about the debate, partly realistic, partly psychological about whether to immigrate or to stay. And that debate had been going on ever since um, the slavers brought Africans to the 13 colonies. Um, I'm sure many people know that at the time of the American War of Independence in the 1770s, uh, when the British um, loyalists among the colonists escaped under the protection of the British forces, thousands of Africans and African Americans went with them. Um, and their saga is complex. Um, largely tragic, but thousands left. Um, they said, you know, all that um, talk about freedom and the rights of man was nonsense. Um, and there had been all through the history of people of African descent in what became the United States, there had been that strain of argument that we don't belong here, we should go. Uh, Martin Delaney and the formation of a kind of cohesive black nationalist sentiment in the 1860s, um, 1870s, uh, made that argument uh, about immigration, about leaving the United States. And the Garvey movement picked that up. Uh, they rapidly 
saw then that you know mass immigration was was not practical. Um, psychological immigration was was the fallback response, and you know many Garveyites um, psychologically um, gave up their American citizenship. Um, but black people have always wrestled with, well, with the question of where are you gonna go, right? <laughs> where, where are you going to go? Um, but on the other side of that, black people's commitment to, again, what I said was the idea of tolerance and equality in a multiracial society, an American society from colonial times was always multiracial. Part of the, the American myth is that, well, you had the colonists, the British settlers, then you had black people. But no, you had the colonists, the British settlers, you had Native Americans, you had the enslaved Black people, and you had the free Black people, you had the French, you had the Spanish. Right? This was a multiracial society from the very beginning. But Black people's commitment to the ideal was so powerful in part because as some people have said, black people are the only Americans who were created in America. <laughs> we are African-Americans, right? Um, and we were here uh, before the Mayflower almost, right? We were here before the Mayflower. We were here before all of these Johnny come lately white ethnic groups. Um, that's hard to give up, especially because people fought to achieve the goal for so long. Mm. So the Black American patriotism thing um, is, um, it is what it is. Uh, now, for the rest of you, I, I, I told, Nigel, that I don't believe in, <laughs> I'm not a devotee of the Black American patriotism thing, um, though I celebrate it. Mm. Um, for me, I don't pledge allegiance. Uh, and I haven't since I was 13 years old. But I celebrate it because the Black American patriotism thing is I think for the mass of black Americans, a way of saying, this is our country too, and we're not surrendering, right? And there you have it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I understand that, but you know, when I hear you speak, I'm thinking particularly of the eighties when Jesse Jackson wrestled with this question, right? And he, he wanted to move Americans from being Negroes and black people to African-Americans. I thought that the uh, black American uh, masses contended with this question then. So now that we see it in the noughties and 21st century, it seems like uh, for me, a massive obstacle uh, to unite the diaspora first before we can unite the continent. And I worry that it's going to be uh, another generation before we can actually, as you said in your talk, resolve our differences between us, right? Uh, and the things that keep us so fragmented. So interesting thoughts there. No. Well, you may be right. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you are right. Um, I think part of, part of, the underlying dynamic 
is uh, among Black Americans, uh, the migration dynamic. Mm. Black people have always been moving toward something, right? Um, mm. Toward full selfhood. Uh, the, the, the movement of uh, Black people you know, out of the South after the American Civil War. Um, the, the movement of the great migrations. Um, and now we have the reverse migration, right? Black people are moving back to the South in appreciable numbers. Um, and Black people have always been moving psychologically. They've always been migrating psychologically. They've always been considering what do we do now? The name changes that Black Americans have gone through over the span of their existence in America is a manifestation of that you know, psychological movement, that psychological migration. That is, okay, this is where we are now. This is what we call ourselves now. Mm. This is where we are now. This is where we call ourselves, what we call ourselves now, right? Um, and is, is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Um, is that perpetual motion not hurting us? Is that not to our detriment? I don't know. Mm. Uh, I mean, certainly, given the circumstance that uh, we in the United States of America are in today, politically, uh, where um, you know the, the the Voting Rights Act of 1965 has been virtually dismantled. Um, where we have a um, intense white racist authoritarian movement um, that has captured, you know, some twenty to thirty uh, state legislatures. Um, mm -hmm. One can certainly say that we, not only black people, but other people of color and a whole bunch of white people have hard times ahead. Mm. Um, you know, even that future, even that future is cloudy. Right. That future is immediately cloudy. And the long-term um, consequences are cloudy. Right. So what that means for Black Americans' um, allegiance to their Black American patriotism, again, may be open for question. Right. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here from Apike. Apike, do you want to come off mute and you can ask your question? Um, thank you um, so much, Professor Daniels, for um, a wonderful, wonderful um, um, conversation and looking at the significance of this later stage of um, Malcolm X's life. I wanted to ask uh, two questions, if possible. The first I wanted to ask is um, just from the way you spoke, I think you perhaps value um, this sort of the last few years of, of uh, Malcolm X's life for perhaps his rejection of some of the rhetoric of his earlier days and maybe the violence that might have characterized or that might have been inherent in some of that rhetoric. So I wanted to just ask what your views were about the place of violence in liberation and the place of violence, particularly in, in Pan-African iterations of liberation movements. And um, maybe if you can touch upon whether you have the same sort of view when we're thinking of sort of Fanon, um, and his embracing of um, 
of an, an aspect of, of violence? That's my first question. Um, the second question I wanted to ask is if you could give us your views about the place of multiplicity within Pan-African discourse. So um, I, I don't know if it's unique to, obviously we're all here because we're interested in this type of discourse, but there seems to be um, a discomfort in the evolution of thinkers or the ideas that thinkers can inhabit different positions at different times. I'm reading quite widely and um, quite um, a lot about Blyden at the moment and this kind of fascination with his transformation from um, his early work, which was embracing of colonial ideas and his later work in um, that embraced more the African personality. So if you could just give us your thoughts about multiplicity, about transformation, um, within um, of thinkers and should or does Pan-Africanism um, embrace that enough? Is it a problem for people to inhabit multiple spaces in the course of a lifetime or even in, on different points? I hope those two make sense. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of violence, I think violence can be a um, strategic, uh, pursue um, in other places. It, it, it wouldn't have worked in the United States um, in part because there were too few black people and there were too many white people first. Uh, there were too many black people who did not believe that violence would work second. And there were too many white people who would have been perfectly happy to use all the violence they could against black people everywhere. Um, so the, um, the, the kind of, there are two kinds of violence. The one is the romantic notions of violence. And the other is, um, the kind of nihilistic notions of violence. So the romantic notions of violence for the United States, not necessarily for elsewhere, but the romantic notions of violence for the United States were the kind of, you know, we're, we're going to stage a kind of, you know, Che Guevara movement here and overthrow the MFs and, you know, take over the country and establish a black homeland and, you know, all that kind of stuff, um, that would have gone nowhere um, for the reasons I stated. The other kind of violence, which was the nihilistic violence, would also have gone nowhere, but it could have been applied. And so the nihilistic violence, to me, an example of the nihilistic violence, were was the troubles in Northern Ireland. That kind of, we don't give a damn. We're just gonna take as many as we can with us. Um, and, you know, if we have to go into the prisons and go on hunger strikes, starve ourselves to death, we're just going to do whatever. That kind of violence There may have been a possibility for that kind of violence, which is to say, if one considers what would have happened if the great civil rights acts of the mid 1960s, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act had not been passed, what would have happened in the United States while the United States was trying to prosecute the war in Vietnam. What would have happened? Because in my view, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was essentially the end of the civil rights movement in a way. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 just got in under the deadline. The deadline, of course, was Watts, the Watts Rebellion of 1965, which broke 
within a week or 10 days of Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act. And the fact that the Watts Rebellion broke in Los Angeles, the land of palm trees, single family homes, all that sort of stuff was completely mystifying to white America, not mystifying to black America. There was the uncapping of the anger. Harlem had had a rebellion in the summer of 1964, but no one thought that was a harbinger. But Watts initiated that long string of long hot summer rebellions. Watts was the uncapped of black anger. And um, it, this is sort of a personal thing. I celebrate every October 4th. So why do I celebrate every October 4th? Because of Sputnik. The Russians launched Sputnik, at least they told the world about it, on October 4th, 1957. Right. A month after the Little Rock school desegregation crisis here in the United States. So if you look at from Sputnik 1957 to the Voting Rights Act 1965, what happened in between those two points? The first thing that happened after Sputnik was the United States, which is to say white America, got scared. And white America then said, we need to educate the whole population. And that meant aid to education at the elementary through the college and graduate school level. They opened, Congress opened the spigot and all sorts of money flowed to both uh, the um, public schools for teaching math and science and flow to scholarship and loans for college students. Now, the Congress in its whiteness meant that money for white students, but black students took advantage of that money too. I could not have gone to college without federal money, both scholarship and then loans, which came at very, very, very low interest rates. And so you had this huge increase in the number of youth going to college, white youth and then black youth. Right? The numbers of black youth going to college in the 1960s jumped tremendously. So to go back to the deadline, Watts, that saved the United States of America, Sputnik did, in my view, because if black youth like me had seen no chance of going to college in the late 1950s through the 1960s, when the civil rights movement was jumping, but the civil rights movement was going to meet with the failure of its goals. What would the United States have looked like in the late 1960s with Vietnam? Because Vietnam was going to happen anyway, right? What would the United States have looked like? I'm, I'm kind of swinging all over the place in terms of the violence thing, but those were the potentials for violence in this country. But that potential, frankly, was always going to be very, the potential was always going to be small in this country. Again, Nigel, because of black American patriotism, <laughs> that potential was going to be very small, but its use in other countries you know, many black people 
um, during the civil rights years and ever afterward, if you talk to a lot of black Americans, you know, who were alive during that time, they will say, well, you know, I wasn't particularly um, enamored of, I, I'm not an adherent of nonviolence per se, but it seemed to be the thing that was working then. And, and they will say, I believe King was, I believe John Lewis was, I believe they were, so that was enough. Right? Mm -hmm. That was enough to draw people. Right? Um, so the violence thing is, um, is an interesting question. Just one more thing, then I'll move on. Um, in the South, and several people have written books about this, beneath the level of the civil rights movement, there were the black Southerners who were kind of a backstop to the movement, which is to say, uh, there was a group called the Deacons for Self-Defense in Louisiana. There were groups in, uh, there was a group in North Carolina and then there were just randomly organized groups of black men in black neighborhoods who put the word out that they were not going to allow the Klan to come night riding in their communities. And if the Klan did so, they would be met by black people with guns, right? And so, the movement operated on the level of nonviolence while behind the movement, just ordinary black Southerners provided a measure of protection that don't do that because you'll regret it, right? Don't come here because you'll regret it. So the, the, the violence question operated at a very low grade in the United States. Um, it had its uses elsewhere, I think. Uh, that would be for others to come. Um, in terms of multiplicity, uh, I, I think there was a, I think there was a wide tolerance for it among black Americans actually. And so uh, that is people changing their views and people ho holding views that um, were not mainstream views, um, including views that um, white people construed as anti-white, right? So, if you know what happened to Paul Robeson, right? Paul Robeson was always honored among black people. Um, if you know how Du Bois changed his views over time, of course, Du Bois was a controversial figure when he was alive for many reasons. Um, and uh, he was thrown out of the NAACP in the 1930s. Um, but Du Bois was still always honored by black people in this country. Um, and um, Du Bois was, one might say, given a shout out at the 1963 March on Washington, where they announced that he had just died that morning in Ghana, right? Um, at the very beginning of the March on Washington, they announced that Du Bois had just died. But if, so if you look at Du Bois's life, and the, again, the twisting and turning he took to try to find a way, and then coming to the conclusion that no, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Du Bois stands as a powerful model to Black Americans about that. That is, Du Bois, 
Du Bois' life says, if you live long enough, you'll see what I saw, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you, you know, what Malcolm would have said about his changing views um, had he lived <laughs> would have been damned interesting. Right? It, it, that, that would have been extraordinary to have Malcolm there explaining um, what he meant, what he now meant, why it was, why he had changed. Um, as King became, as King moved leftward, you can say King moved leftward or simply King revealed more of his leftist views that had always been there, right? Um, but if, if you know of uh, the Cornell West book, the book that Cornell West put together called The Radical King, where he, um, he talks about and publishes several of King's more radical speeches right, to show in Cornell's view that King was always radical, right? And that he was, he was revealing, explaining, articulating more of his leftist views because he saw how deep and pervasive the racism was. Again, to go back to Black American patriotism, it has been um, extraordinarily difficult for Black Americans to, for all the rhetoric to understand how deep, how structurally deep the racism goes. Despite all, all that we know, it, it's been, um, every time you read something further about the structure of racism, you know, you, you're left with, damn, I didn't, damn, what a betrayal, right? Um, so, uh, the coming to that, um, the coming to that has largely been the stuff of, you know, activists and intellectuals. Um, e even though the broad knowledge of the structure of racism in the United States is widely spread among Black people, um, but it's. Um, It's a hard thing to contemplate. It's a hard thing to contemplate, again, because of the nature of this country, the nature of the American project, um, and the pervasiveness of the myths. You look at critical race theory, right? And um, you see the reaction of apparently millions of whites, not all whites by any means, because some whites are fighting that struggle, but the reaction of those on the right to just to the fact that these Confederates were traitors to the United States of America. And they cannot accept even that, let alone that George Washington was a slaveholder and a mean slaveholder. That Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder. That Patrick Henry, the, the founders of the country, Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death, also said in a letter to a Quaker abolitionist that he wished, I'm paraphrasing, he wished he could give up slavery, but it's so hard for the convenience of it. 
right? To, to, I mean, that's the, that's the new struggle. I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got here a comment in the chat that I believe Raquel would like your views on. And then there is a question from Andy as well. So I'll just put those both to you now. So Raquel has said, uh, the shape-shifting nature of racism seems to make movements psychic and otherwise necessary. Okay. Ab absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's easy. Okay. And then uh, the question, sorry? Well, I was just going to say that that is so true because the racism goes so deep and um, some of it is unconscious, individually expressed. Some of it is unconscious. And some of it is um, conscious, but buried under liberal platitudes. So a quick example. Uh, some of you may have heard of this flap at ESPN when a um, black woman um, sports reporter at ESPN. I assume everybody knows what ESPN is, um, the sports channel. A black woman was given anchor duties for the NBA finals. And a white woman who had been at, the, uh, at ESPN and was a basketball reporter also um, both of them very good, that the white woman was caught in a, having a private conversation in which she said of the black woman that, well, yes, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she's, she's good, but, you know, the, the ESPN is in this whole diversity thing. And so, you know, that, that's why she's getting it over me, right? And this blew up. And I looked at that and I said, now, and there's no question that both of these reporters are good. They're good. I said, now here's a white woman who, in terms of being a sportscaster, is there because of affirmative action. Because in the old days, white women were not sportscasters. That's just, right? So. And here is a black woman who is there because of affirmative action, because in the old days, black women weren't sportscasters either. But the, the white woman takes what could have been simply a, you know, ordinary job competition thing between two people and turns it into well, she's getting this over me because she's black. And, you know, and I wanted to shout, how do you think you got your job? You got your job the same way she got her job because it's not a white man's world on ESPN anymore. So why do you have to bring the race thing in it? Right? There's that level of racism. Okay. Uh, and sorry, the next question was? Yes, yeah, so the next question is from Andy. Um, just bear in mind as well, we've got about five minutes left. Um, so he says, Malcolm X was deeply committed to uh, Sunni Islam while at the same time, deeply invested in revolutionary black nationalism linked to radical socialism. How was he able to marry the religious with the secular? So was Sunni Islam deemed to be closer to black power ideology than Christianity for Malcolm X? It's a big question there. I am not sure. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I know for black people, um, that is for the mass of black people, um, in the 1960s, the early 1960s, they had 
um, Islam was opaque to them. They, they knew that the black Muslim ideology was not true Islam, but they didn't know what true Islam was. And they did not have a understanding of the different sects of Islam. Um, and so while they were used to the uh, religious pageantry of Christianity, both white Christianity and black Christianity, they were not used to the pageantry and the explanations for the pageantry of Islam. Um, and I think there was, there was probably a suspicion of it, um, of what Islam was in general, because they had never been exposed to it. It had never been explained to them. The, the pervading um, cast of American society was, okay, Christianity is it. Okay, Judaism is it. The rest of that stuff, no. Buddhism, no. Um, whatever, 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 all that other stuff that the rest of the world practices, no. It's just Christian, it's just the Judeo-Christian ethic. And everything else is, well, polite society, polite American society wouldn't say it, but impolite American society, all, all that other stuff is illegitimate, right? So again, how Malcolm was going to explain his view that um, Islam had um, a role to play in the liberation of black Americans was going to be a big challenge. It was going to be an enormous challenge given what um, religion meant to black people then. Uh, everybody black went to church. <laughs> Um, you know, religion, church attendance has been declining ever since the 1960s. But in the 1960s, everybody went to church, right? Um, it was a cultural anchor. And so, you know, Black Protestantism was king. And the various, the, the various sects, it's probably too strong a word, but the various denominations of black Protestantism were king. So how Malcolm was going to organize a movement that had a significant Islamic input was an, is another one of those open questions. <laughs>